Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Tara Schroeder. I'm the Education Coordinator for Green Mountain Conservation Group. And if you're not familiar with our organization, we're a nonprofit watershed organization that's mission is to protect the natural resources of our Ossipee watershed. And we do that through research, education, advocacy, and land conservation. Um, I'm joined tonight by UNH Cooperative Extension Wildlife Conservation State Specialist, Haley Andriozzi, and Chikora Lake Conservancy Stewardship Director, Deborah Marnich. And we're here to learn about the importance of wildlife corridors and how people can take action in their communities to protect these vital passageways for wildlife. <clears throat> So when communities protect wildlife habitat, they also help to ensure clean water, which is one of the big pieces of Green Mountain's mission, clean air, healthy soils, and more, because as we know, everything's connected. Here at Green Mountain, we often say water knows no boundaries. And as water flows over and beneath property, town, and state lines, um, and in order to protect water resources, we have to protect water collaboratively with our neighbors across watersheds. The same can be said for wildlife corridors. When we talk about protecting important, important wildlife habitat and corridors, we need to take the collaborative approach once again and work with an ecosystem approach, looking at the landscape from the wildlife's perspective. Um, so for Haley tonight in her role as the Wildlife Conservation State Specialist at UNH Cooperative Extension, Haley works with volunteers, landowners, natural resource professionals, and communities to enhance, restore, and conserve wildlife habitat throughout New Hampshire. She manages outreach, citizen science, and stewardship projects related to New Hampshire's wildlife species and their habitats, including for species of greatest conservation need. Haley coordinates the New Hampshire Coverts Project, Taking Action for Wildlife and the Women in the Woods Program. She received her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Natural Resources Management from the University of Rhode Island and earned a Master's of Science in Wildlife and Conservation Biology from the University of New Hampshire. As for Deborah, Deborah brings to the Chikora Lake Conservancy over 30 years of land conservation planning, project management, outreach, and environmental education expertise. Prior to joining the CLC in September of two th excuse me, 2022, Deborah enjoyed a 20 year career with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service as a conservation planner in Carroll County, New Hampshire, helping private landowners and nonprofit organizations navigate and implement federal conservation programs and assisting them with conservation planning. Through this work, she has established deep connections in the Chikora Lake area where she has worked with the CLC and other landowners in the basin area on NRCS conservation projects. Deborah holds a bachelor's degree in zoology and a master's degree in forestry from Southern Illinois University. All right. I'm going to now turn everything over to Haley to start. And that'll be, she'll be followed by Deborah. And like I said, if you do have a clarifying question throughout the program, feel free to raise your hand or enter it into the chat feature. If you have like an inquiry or want to find out more from one of our speakers, feel free to save that question till the end and we'll go over them at the end. All right. So. This. And just as a reminder, if folks could remember to um, mute themselves, and this is being recorded, so we'll have the recording available for folks to view later. Um, and share with your friends. Okay, so. I see Tom's question in the chat about the bobcat making those sounds. That's a good one, Tom. <laughs> I do. It's fair warning. I do have my dog here, so I mean, I think he should be pretty quiet. But um, that is just a he's part sleeping. Of the whole so thing. if something if something spooks him, there might be a bark. But um, 
Terry, can I, am I good to stop your screen sharing or are you? Yes, I'm getting out of it right now. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to, all right, very good. Okay. All right. Um, let me just check, make sure that looks good. Okay. Thanks, Tara. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, and Tara introduced me, but just to reiterate, I'm Haley Andriozzi. I work for UNH Cooperative Extension as the state specialist in wildlife conservation. And, um, you know, our work at Extension is really needs-based. And I would say over the last five years or so, especially the topic of wildlife corridors has been gaining increasing interest in the conservation community with private landowners in the state and with communities all across the state of New Hampshire. And, you know, I don't have data on this, but I'm sure that trend attracts nationally as well, that this this terminology, the concept of wildlife corridors is becoming more and more interesting to folks. And so people are interested in learning more and learning more about what they can do to create or benefit wildlife corridors um, in their communities and across the landscape. So uh, excited to be here tonight and to kind of actually pi pilot this presentation. So you all are kind of my guinea pigs. Um, so thanks for letting me test it out on you. Uh, we need to start again with a terminology that might be kind of new to folks. I always want to start by providing a definition. And so when we talk about wildlife corridors, what we're really talking about is a habitat linkage. Or, oh, oh, I didn't know if that was a question. Okay. Uh, we're really talking about a habitat linkage or connection um, that joins two or more areas of habitat. And that linkage allows for the movement of wildlife from one area to another. Um, we often hear or use, you know, terms like permeability areas, connection, linkage, corridor. Those are kind of often used interchangeably or in concert when we're talking about wildlife corridors. And ultimately what wildlife corridors do is allow for what we call ecological connectivity. And ecological connectivity is really the unimpeded movement of species and the flow of natural processes. So essentially, you know, is there a connection on the landscape that allows movement of species and for natural processes to happen? And that can include both structural connectivity, so, you know, the physical connectedness of habitats across the landscape, as well as the functional connectivity. You know, is there enough connection to allow organisms to actually move across the landscape? So, you know, there's a lot of kind of buzzwords in the definition of wildlife corridor, but it's really thinking about habitats that are joined together or connected to allow for movement from one place to another. <laughs> and, you know, in addition to the definition of wildlife corridors, I also like to think about, you know, when we're presenting on topics like these, you know, why are they important? And I think that's important to think about and frame. I'll do my best to frame it for you, but you can think about it for yourself as well from the outset of this presentation. And, you know, New Hampshire, depending on how you count, is home to uh, an incredible diversity of wildlife species. We have around 500 species of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, and that doesn't count the somewhere around 11,000 known species of beetles, bugs, and other insects, and those are just the known species. And all of these wildlife species rely on habitats like forests or wetlands or fields to meet their basic needs. Um, but wildlife don't just stay in one place, right? They need to move. And that's true regardless of our, you know, if you're our smallest insect or our largest mammal. Different species move various distances to find shelter, to find food, to reproduce, to migrate between different seasonal habitats, if they're using different habitat types at different times of the year, and to disperse to new territories. So that's typically true for juveniles of many of our species who are, you know, at the age of maturity or adulthood, um, going out to find their own territory beyond their, their parents. Providing linkages in the form of wildlife corridors between habitats really allows wildlife to move safely from one area to another. And that is important because it reduces the risk of population extinction. You know, with our, it helps to maintain genetic diversity. Um, so one reason that wildlife move is to be able to interact and uh, essentially breed with each other. And so allowing for wildlife movement across a region is really important to maintain gene flow and prevent um, inbreeding in populations. 
And it also is going to ensure that species are better able to adapt to our changing climate. So when we hear about climate change and natural resources, we often hear about the potential need for species, both plants and animals, to migrate as climate conditions change in their current locations. And um, having wildlife corridors on the landscape that allow for and facilitate that movement is going to make the impact of climate change um, on populations less extreme. We also, you know, need to think about what our landscape looks like for wildlife species when thinking about wildlife corridors. You know, as we've seen increasing human activity in the landscape in the last, you know, several decades, but at this point, almost 100, 150 years, things like roads, houses, and other de development can really result in the direct loss of wildlife habitat. And the habitat blocks that are remaining on the landscape become fragmented into smaller and smaller habitat blocks. Maintaining and restoring connected habitats is critical for wildlife as our landscape changes and you know, will continue to change in the future. And that's because the loss of wildlife corridors can result in direct mortality to wildlife species. It can create barriers to movement, so it can prevent that dispersal that's really important for wildlife species. Um, it can also result in further habitat fragmentation. And the risks to um, the loss of wildlife corridors is really high for slow moving species, so species that um, like reptiles and amphibians that move slowly, um, species that depend on high adult survivorship. So species like turtles, where adult turtles are extremely valuable to the population overall. Species that are long range dispersers, so species that travel or cover really large distances. Think about animals like bobcats that can have a home range of up to 20 square miles and species that already have limited populations to begin with. So species like timber rattlesnakes, for instance, where there's just one known population here in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and we also need to think about what we know to be a significant risk to wildlife and especially to wildlife corridors, which is highways and other roads. And highways and other roads are proven barriers to wildlife. Um, a study of bobcats here in New Hampshire, for example, found a distinct genetic difference between bobcats that existed on the east side of Route 93 and bobcats that existed on the west side of Route 93. And so that indicates that bobcats are not often crossing the highway um, to breed. And that effect has been documented for other species. That's just one example. You know, animals can be deterred from crossing roads due to traffic volume, noise, pollutants, and a lack of crossing options. But the amount of roadkill that we see is a testament to the fact that roads don't always deter wildlife. And the result is that vehicle collisions are the leading cause of wildlife mortality in the United States. Okay, so that's some of the context for thinking about, you know, what wildlife corridors are, uh, what some of the threats to wildlife corridors are, and why it might be important to identify them and um, take action to um, protect and or manage them in some cases. But to further kind of dive into what wildlife corridors might look like, um, you know, they can take different forms and they vary in scale depending on the landscape and the wildlife species that's actually being considered. Some examples of these connections across the landscape might include forested areas. So the large majority of our state is forested and subsequently many of our wildlife species rely on forested habitat in some form. And so very frequently when we're talking about wildlife corridors, what we're really talking about is connections between connections between forested habitat blocks of forested area. Again, because it is the dominant habitat type in our state and because it is uh, the, provides the cover and structure that many wildlife species are using to move across the landscape. Riparian areas are also really valuable wildlife corridors. Um, riparian areas are it's a terminology that we use to describe the areas alongside rivers and streams. And when vegetated, we typically refer to them as riparian corridors. Um, riparian areas supply food, cover, and water for a large diversity of wildlife. So they are one of those kind of features on the landscape that provide a really valuable habitat benefit. 
And they also serve as migration routes and stopping points between habitats for a variety of species. Many wildlife species will move along riparian corridors, and so there's inherently have um, valuable, they're valuable as a wildlife corridor on the landscape and just their, their existence. Ridgelines can also function as valuable wildlife corridors. These tend to be larger vegetated areas with high elevation habitat, and they often have limited development or barriers. And so they can um, kind of be function as connections between larger habitat blocks. But then even patches of habitat, patches of vegetation like hedgerows, um, these small vegetated strips or patches at the edge of an agricultural field or in your yard can connect larger habitat blocks. You know, at a small scale, they're providing food and cover for wildlife, and they're also functioning as a potential movement corridor for wildlife, again, on a smaller scale. They're not necessarily going to make the difference for most species at the population level, but they can have a, you know, positive impact for wildlife, um, a more localized impact for wildlife. And then another type of corridor that gets a lot of attention or that we think about, uh, you know, I would say spend a lot of time um, inventorying, assessing, and, um, and and thinking about taking action on are wildlife road crossings. <clears throat> and wildlife road crossings are essentially road stretches where wildlife cross over or under the road service, excuse me, surface. Usually this is occurring with some regularity, but crossings can also have less frequent use. Um, and road crossings occur across a range of spatial and temporal scales. Um, wildlife crossings that do connect priority habitat blocks are important for state and regional connectivity. So many of you have probably seen crossing signs like this for turtles, deer, moose. Um, in most cases, those areas have signs because they've been identified as areas where wildlife are opting or electing to cross the road um, in higher numbers than, than in other places. So um, there is some the strategy to the locations where wildlife are opting to cross the roads based on usually the surrounding landscapes and the characteristics of that crossing itself. There are many, many wildlife species that use wildlife corridors. Um, I'm going to focus, I'm just going to provide you with information on a few of them tonight, or, or I should say key in on a few of them tonight that are kind of what we might consider poster children or poster species for wildlife corridors here in New Hampshire. Um, the first is Blanding Turtles. If uh, you haven't heard of Blanding Turtles, that's not unreasonable because they're not um, they're not really found uh, outside of the southern and mostly southeastern part of the state. They are a state, state endangered species um, here in the state of New Hampshire, again, found in the, the southern portion of the state. They use a diversity of wetland habitats, aquatic habitats, and upland habitats. And they often travel a mile or more between these different habitat types. Um, typically during the breeding season, when uh, female turtles especially are traveling to nesting locations to find that ideal nesting habitat to lay their eggs. And all of this traveling and moving across the landscape brings them into contact with roads and vehicles and other human-made barriers. So you can think back that you know, 200, 250 years ago, that was not the case, but turtles have been traveling this landscape um, in those long range distances for a long time. And as they've continued to do that, we have put up roads in their way and houses in their way and um, Jersey barriers in their way. And so, um, yeah, they encounter a lot of hazards given the relatively long distance that they travel to, especially during the nesting season. And then on top of that, landing turtles occur in pretty low population numbers. That's in part because they don't begin to reproduce until they're between 14 to 20 years old. So they have to survive an incredibly long amount of time in order to make it to reproductive age. And then each year they lay only a few eggs. And so when we have wildlife species with those characteristics, it means that adult deaths can have a really significant impact on the populations. And here in New Hampshire, roads are actually the primary cause of adult mortality in Blanding's turtles. And so a lot of the work we do around blanding turtles is to promote large blocks of connected wetland and upland habitat that has limited development in between. So really trying to minimize the barriers that blanding turtles face um, by having connected, conserved habitats um, of the different types of wetland complexes and upland habitats that they require. Another species that uses 
uh, why like corridors or relies on them heavily, I should say here in New Hampshire are American Martin. And again, if you haven't heard of them, that's not unreasonable because they are not that common and really only found in the northern part of the state. Um, they're a species of greatest conservation need. They use mostly high elevation habitats, um, mature softwood stands, mixed wood forests that have a really complex structure. So if you think of almost like, um, you know, the definition of what you might consider mature or old growth forest with tons of cavity trees and downed woody material, you know, they really like those uh, intricate, interesting habitats. Um, all that material provides really valuable habitat for their prey species, critters like mice, voles, shrews, red squirrels. And, you know, they typically find this type of habitat in spruce fir forests above 2,700 feet in elevation. So that's a pretty uh, niche um, habitat selection. They don't really use non-forested areas. You know, they, they actually avoid them. And so they require really large blocks of forested habitat and movement corridors in order to disperse long distances and to provide for gene flow between populations. Um, there's been research done in Vermont, for instance, which is a pretty isolated population, you know, showing that because there isn't connection to other populations across the region, you know, there has been some level of inbreeding in that population of, of Martin um, over in, in Vermont. Um, so yeah, they, they travel, you know, miles and miles, they travel distances, and so they really require these um, connected habitats of forests at high elevation. And then the last species, um, just to kind of demonstrate that it's not just super rare species that rely on wildlife corridors is um, spotted salamanders. So spotted salamanders are relatively common throughout the state, even if you've never seen one. Um, you know, they live kind of a secretive life where they adults spend the majority of their life underground or in logs in the forest. But they annually emerge on what many of you have probably heard referred to as big night or big nights um, on the first handful of warm, rainy spring nights to make their way to vernal pools, which are these ephemeral or seasonal wetlands in forested settings where they breed and lay their eggs. <clears throat> and as they travel from those forested areas to the vernal pools, you know, they attempt to cross roadways that are in between those two locations. And so spotted salamanders, much like many of our migrating amphibians, can suffer really high mortality rates from vehicles, particularly during that spring migration. And that road mortality can have a significant impact on amphibian populations. So spotted salamanders and other amphibians that you know have this same migratory pattern really benefit from corridors that connect these two habitats, forested areas and vernal pools for breeding. And it's not just those species, it's many, many more um, species that are relying on wildlife corridors. There are luckily some actions that individuals and communities can take to conserve, manage, or restore wildlife corridors. And kind of the first step or the first thing that we usually point people to is to start learning and sharing about wildlife corridors. You know, it's a really important step in conserving these valuable areas. And I would say the first step of this first step is really about identifying large habitat areas and important wildlife corridors in your community. And I say in your community because, you know, wildlife corridors, as I think you heard and gathered at this point, are really kind of a landscape scale issue, question, problem, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, you know, really thinking of a, at a community level is how we most often think about wildlife corridors. Um, then they can also be thought of regionally, statewide, uh, regionally within New Hampshire, statewide, regionally at a like within a national scale and even nationally. So um, there's all sorts of scales to think about wildlife corridors, but I'd say community is the most common that we deal with here in New Hampshire. And so, you know, you can start to figure out where are the wildlife for important and valuable wildlife corridors in our community. You can determine whether those areas are on conserved lands or not and where and how they intersect roadways. And so really it's about doing an inventory and assessment of what is out there on the landscape. Um, luckily, there are a few ways and tools to identify potentially important wildlife corridors. Um, one way is to document areas used by wildlife and to share relevant observations. And some of that can be done through New Hampshire Wildlife Sightings, which is a web tool run by New Hampshire Fish and Game for reporting wildlife observations. Those observations don't have to just include, you know, 
live wildlife sightings. They can include road crossings, um, specifically where you see wildlife crossing a road, but also roadkill, tracks, and other wildlife observations. And those records that are submitted to New Hampshire wildlife sightings can help identify mortality and crossing hotspots and help to prior, um, identify these potentially valuable wildlife corridors and priority wildlife habitats. So the New Hampshire state map that you see here on the right illustrates an example of potential applications of New Hampshire wildlife sightings data to help determine wildlife road crossing locations. So this is essentially a heat map um, model where reptile and amphibian occurrences that are tagged as either road crossing um, or road kill or those black dots. And they've created kind of a heat map around areas where we're seeing a higher density of those um, road crossings or road kill. So this is just a sample of 500 records, records that New Hampshire Fish and Game used to demonstrate what can be done with this data. Um, but modeling efforts based on real data like this one can aid in the identification of potential roadkill or crossing hotspots in your community. And wildlife sightings is just one tool. You can also do this type of data collection with a variety of different tools, whether it's iNaturalist, which is another type of data collection platform, or even using, I'd say, um, more um, uh, less technology focused means of collecting data from local community members. Um, but that local data component is really valuable when identifying wildlife corridors. With that said, there was a statewide initiative to try and identify valuable wildlife corridors across the state of New Hampshire, um, and it resulted in what's called the New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors Map. Um, this was created by New Hampshire Fish and Game a few years ago. I guess it's been a couple of years. I don't, I don't know when this launched. <laughs> it's been out. It's been made publicly available for the last couple of years, um, and it really was designed for use by conservation planner, planners, landowners, land trusts, biologists, conservation commissions and others who are interested in identifying these important features. And it essentially shows areas that connect important core wildlife habitat all across the state. So you see here there's prioritized habitat blocks in that greenish color. And those are areas that are over 50 acres in size that have been identified as a priority in New Hampshire's wildlife action plan. And then the orange um, are those what are identified as um, potentially valuable wildlife corridors that connect those prioritized habitat blocks. And so this can be a really useful prioritization and planning tool for communities and conservation organizations that are trying to wrap their heads around, you know, important habitat features and connections between those features on the landscape. You know, it is important to note that the map doesn't represent locations of known wildlife corridors. Um, you know, rather it's a display of how a model of habitat suitability and movement behavior of wildlife species translates into patterns of um, landscape connectivity. And so best practices would really suggest that, you know, users of this data, of this map, should do their best to incorporate local data sources and to really ground truth the results of corridor analyses um, in order to identify those critical connectivity areas. Haley, can I interrupt you for a second? It's Terry. Yeah. Yep. Um, there's a question about the previous slide map um, from Karen Payne. She asks, is the map density related to the number of people reporting in that area? Yeah, so it's a heap, every dot you see is an individual record. Of, so it's not necessarily the number of people reporting, but the number of records reported. So theoretically, it could be one person reporting. <laughs> you know, multiple observations, but each of the black observations is an individual observation of a roadkill wildlife species or an individual observation of a wildlife species crossing a road. And so again, it's not, this is not meant to be comprehensive, but just to show kind of what you can do with this type of data where you can start to, you know, where these observations occur in higher density start to map out um, potential hotspots or road crossing locations. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there are also regional modeling efforts that are focused on wildlife corridors. So these are just a couple of examples of those here. One is the Staying Connected Initiative, which um, works across the Northern Appalachian and Acadian region of the United States and Canada. Primarily here in New Hampshire, it's spearheaded by um, the Nature Conservancy and they use GIS models to basically identify already conserved lands and then say, okay, what are the important connections between those conserved lands? So really to try and focus conservation efforts in the region um, on connecting lands that are already conserved. And then similarly, um, 
Connect the Coast is an effort done in the southeastern part of the state that you see here in the coastal watershed on the right. Um, and they led a similar effort in and around that coastal watershed. And so really, again, to identify critical connectors between um, regionally significant conservation land and habitat blocks. And this can really help to prioritize land protection efforts for the region. And then there are some groups that are taking on um, even more localized projects. So this is an example of a map from a study being uh, spearheaded by the Upper Valley Land Trust right now. They hired a consultant named Jesse Moore to um, work to identify important habitat blocks and barriers to wildlife movement in the Upper Valley. And so they're using a lot of field data collection, like wildlife cameras, like you see here, um, wildlife tracking, amphibian crossing surveys and a suite of other methods, including, you know, your desktop geospatial analysis to identify potential actions they can do uh, on a local level to create and enhance wildlife corridors in the region. And there are many, many other regional conservation plans that include wildlife corridors in their conservation design. So uh, I guess I would just say if you're interested in finding one near you, <laughs> feel free to reach out um, and I'm happy to point you in the direction of some examples of what those look like. Um, and maybe a less exciting action is um, to use information about wildlife corridors to inform land use decisions. So really to think about planning, land use planning, town planning, um, and making sure wildlife corridors information is incorporated. That can be in town documents like natural resources inventories, conservation plans, and master plan chapters. But maybe one of the most powerful tools that we have to protect wildlife corridors is land protection. And primarily this happens through conservation easements, although that's not the only tool in the toolbox, but protecting land with connectivity as a primary purpose. Again, once you've done the work to identify those important corridors can be a, you know, maybe the most effective way of permanently protecting wildlife corridors. So this action prevents development, and land use conversion and keeps that habitat linkage as a habitat linkage in perpetuity. Um, in some cases, though not always, uh, you know, it might be appropriate to restrict certain recreational uses or fencing or other human activities that could restrict wildlife movement and habitat connectivity if you are conserving that land for the express purpose of connectivity. Um, but we don't see that very often. And in addition to identifying and conserving corridors, actions can also be taken to manage or restore corridors to create a structure that's beneficial to wildlife. So for a lot of our generalist species, as we would call them in the state, so think like white-tailed deer, those species that are just everywhere, you know, they move through a variety of forested and open habitat types. And so often just conserving lands and preventing development is enough to maintain an area as a wildlife corridor for those generalist species. But for specialists, so wildlife species that utilize a more specialized habitat, they may require active habitat management or restoration for an area to be utilized as a corridor. So for example, New England cottontail rabbits found in the southern part of the state um, prefer a dense network of shrubs to move safely um, across the landscape and avoid predators. So you need to make sure that it's a corridor of that shrubland habitat that they require in order to make sure it's functioning as a corridor for New England cottontails. You know, in contrast to that, some amphibians, including those that use vernal pools like the spotted salamander that we mentioned, prefer a forested corridor and that's to avoid desiccation or drying out. And so if wildlife corridors are meant to target specific groups of species, those species habitat needs really need to be considered when developing a management approach um, in that corridor. And then, as I mentioned earlier, streams and rivers are really important travel ways for wildlife moving between habitats. Um, you know, where possible, we recommend maintaining natural um, vegetated buffers of shrubs and forests along water courses. That's not to say that management can't be done in those areas, but maintaining some presence of natural vegetation. And where that doesn't currently exist, you can also create riparian corridors by planting trees and shrubs along streams, which is what you see happening here. Um, and you might also consider controlling invasive species to promote high quality, diverse habitat and riparian corridors. A large part of the work being done on wildlife corridors is to make roads safer for both wildlife and people um, by promoting solutions that allow wildlife to safely cross roads. And so this might include a variety of uh, approaches um, or solutions. For example, you know, the use of seasonal signs, like we talked about earlier, that can alert drivers to slow down for wildlife. 
Um, but I'd say most often it involves an assessment of the current infrastructure at the road crossing and the identification of changes or mechanisms that can be put in place to better facilitate wildlife movement. So, for example, you know, we see a lot of towns and the state working to identify inadequate culverts. Culverts are underpasses that don't allow for um, a fit for wildlife movement or not for the um, ideal amount of wildlife movement. And uh, replacing those inadequate culverts with appropriately, appropriately sized culverts um, can help wildlife pass safely under a road. So this is an example you see here of a, a, a bridge that was created up to um, at Lubberland Creek in Newmarket to allow for the movement of wildlife under that bridge. And there are many factors to take into consideration when designing a culvert, a bridge, or an underpass with wildlife in mind, um, size being one of them. Typically, the bigger the better, but bigger also means more expensive, and they don't always need to be bigger, right? If you're not trying to facilitate the movement of moose or uh, bears, right, you don't necessarily need a larger culvert. So understanding the species you're working to, um, to assist is important. Um, things like light, temperature, moisture, those all play a role in what wildlife species, if any, will use an underpass. And substrate. Um, so, you know, what is the bottom of that, you know, what is the the bank, the bottom, the floor of that culvert of that underpass underneath that bridge? Um, some species will use water, some species will not and require dry land. So usually providing a natural substrate that has a diversity of um, wetness <laughs> and provides a, a dry option for some species can be a good way to go. Um, and just to say, you know, it's not all about terrestrial wildlife. You know, this is an example of a perch culvert that provided, uh, you know, a barrier to movement for our aquatic species, specifically brook trout. And it was replaced with a design that allows for better connectivity for wildlife, again, specifically fish. So you can see on the left that there's no way a fish can swim upstream. You know, they cannot hop up into that culvert. But on the right, having a natural uh, substrate on the bottom with um the ability for uh, wildlife species to travel through that freely. And I'll just say there is support for these types of efforts. The New Hampshire Stream Crossing Initiative is a multi-agency group that works collaboratively to assist with stream assessments across the state, you know, providing tools and resources so that groups can really make data-driven decisions about what are the priorities for infrastructure to be replaced and, um, and, and what makes the most sense. And I just want to emphasize that landscape context is very important for which road crossings are being utilized by wildlife. Um, the road crossing or structure is really just the pinch point between habitat blocks. So that means that land use planning and conservation at those crossings and connecting the crossings to nearby forests are really critical for their long term success. So, you know, you can make a culvert as uh, passable as possible, but if there's not suitable habitat blocks on either side of it, then it's really functioning for no one. And also there's a really important step to be taken in understanding where these patterns of movement are taking place. So, you know, so we talked about inventorying, you know, wildlife corridors in your town, but specifically for road crossings, you know, understanding where wildlife are crossing roads can be a really important focus for community education and awareness about wildlife corridors that cross roadways. And, you know, knowing where these species are crossing provides a means to adjust transportation patterns to help eliminate potential road mortality. Um, or identify sites for road modifications, like, again, making changes to bridges or culverts um, to allow wildlife to safely cross within them. So on the right here is an example of a picture from the Salamander Crossing Brigades, which is run by the Harris Center for Conservation Education in Hancock. They have volunteers trained to collect data on um, salamander migration and on those rainy spring nights. And, you know, based on their data, they've had some local decisions made um, specifically in Keene where roads are closed um, on certain nights of the year when they know that they're going to be ha having heavy amphibian migration in order to protect that hot spot or that that um, specific wildlife crossing. So again, an opportunity for education, community action, and um, having some data-driven decision-making all wrapped into one. Um, so we do, I just wanted to say uh, some, a lot of 
the basic foundational information about wildlife corridors we've taken and put into a brochure to you know make it easier for folks to learn about this topic and to share with others and so if that's something that you think would be useful for you and your work in your community or even sharing with your neighboring landowners you know if you have a use for these brochures you know i'd welcome you to reach out and request some free copies if they are um, beneficial to you and i have a question slide but i think uh we will wait to do questions until the end. Tara, you tell me. Um, yeah, let's wait till the end and have uh, Deb share okay. her screen. Thanks, Haley. Deb, are you? Yep, okay. I'm getting right there. Excellent. How are we doing? Can you see that? It's starting to load, yep. There we go. You're good. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Tara and Hallie, for inviting me to join you this evening. Um, as Tara mentioned, I'm Deborah Marnich. I am the Stewardship Director for Shakora Lake Conservancy. We are a nonprofit land trust in the Shakora Lake Basin area. And our mission focuses on land protection, protection of natural resources and public access. And tonight I'd like to talk to you about wildlife corridors in this local area in Carroll County, specifically from Albany to Ospie. And I wanted to, again, introduce some local example of wildlife corridors from Albany to Ospie. This is actually a map from the New Hampshire Fish and Game Wildlife Corridors data. And I just wanted to reflect on um, the green areas, which are the priority habitat areas, and the orange areas, which are the identified crossing areas. They occur quite frequently between the two towns. Um, there are, are quite a few reasons for that. And um, just buckle up your seatbelt because I'm ready to take you on a little ride with me tonight. I wanted to share my morning drive with you. Um, Haley touched a bit on crossing signs and how crossings are focused in on different areas and accidents and how it's all related. Um, my morning drive is from Conway to Shakura. It's a nice drive. It's a 25 minute drive, enough time to sip some coffee, process some things in your head, but every morning I come across this sign um, on the northern side of Albany that says Moose Crossing next 19, pardon me, 19 miles. And I'm thinking to myself, 19 miles, how could that be possible? So I'm sipping some coffee, I'm driving along and I'm processing all this and thinking what is along this route here to make this such an extensive crossing? And I think to myself, the Shakura River flows um, 15 miles from Albany to Ossipi. Hmm, that's interesting. And I think a little bit more on that topic and what's along the way. And there are so many water features along that 19 miles of corridor. There's about 12 or 15 lakes, ponds, rivers, and multiple streams interconnecting all of that habitat and that corridor. Then that kind of prompts me to think, well, you know, the Ossipi Aquifer is in this area and there are 9,240 total acres in the Ossipi Aquifer. And Tamworth contains about 6,000 of those acres for the Ossipi Aquifer. And it's a, a really important aquifer. It's a stratified drift aquifer. It's formed from glaciers where they deposited mounts of sand and gravel in low-lying areas. And, and it's very vulnerable. So this is, this is all coming together for me as I take my drive in the morning. Take another sip of coffee and I think about diversity of habitats along the corridor. Um, there are wetlands, there are uh, mountains and forests and open fields. There are streams and rivers. There's early successional habitat and just a really, really huge diversity of habitats, which kind of spurs me on to my next thought. And that's really, this is really an important factor in wildlife corridors, land ownership. So as I drive along, I'm seeing the signs, I'm seeing the land ownership, and there are about 15 or 20 different 
organizations that own land that is protected along this corridor. And um, as you know, and Haley mentioned, um, both sides of a wildlife corridor need to be protected, especially if it's going over a road or crosses, something intersects it. Um, the chances of preserving a corridor are greater where the land is preserved on both sides of the road. And there are so many places along this, this road corridor, this 19 mile corridor that are protected. You've got private nonprofits, you've got um, the Forest Service, a federal agency, you've got state lands, um, you've got you know New Hampshire Audubon and SPINIF and, and conservation commissions. And um, it's just an amazing, amazing mix of, of, of land ownership, protected land ownership along the way. I also might add that New Hampshire private landowners make up about 75% of forest land ownership in New Hampshire. That's a lot. That's really a lot. So private landowners, such as yourself, if there's anyone out there in the group that own, owns land, they make a huge, can make a huge difference, a very large impact, no matter what size your land is. So as an organization, um, how is Shakura Lake um, preserving wildlife corridors? We are protecting, conserving, and restoring riparian corridors um, by protecting lakes, vernal pools, rivers, streams, wetlands. And in 2024, we are implementing a shoreline restoration project and it's gonna be the restoration of a thousand feet on the Eastern shoreline of Shakura Lake. We're utilizing a landscape design with nat native vegetation, filtrix tubes and boulders. So mostly native, native materials. We're gonna stabilize and eliminate the soil erosion and compaction and improve water quality, vegetative cover and soil quality. And we're gonna restore the riparian corridor. CLC is also, also conserving and protecting land through conservation easements and covenants. We're stewarding 800 acres over 18 properties of CLC fee-owned land. There are 3,000 acres of protected land in the Shakura Lake Basin through covenants and easements. And as I mentioned previously, protected land provides diversity and resiliency on a landscape level and connects wildlife corridors. Just, um, I really like Kelly's slide that was similar to this. Um, I just wanted to show you a few of our, our local wildlife that's utilizing our corridors. Um, as we mentioned, reptiles, snakes, amphibians, turtles, they need um, a, lot of, a lot of habitat to roam, different seasonal habitats, and they need connectivity to that. Um, they're slow moving critters, they're really vulnerable. So we have a lot of different reptiles and amphibians here in the Shakura Lake Basin area. Um, we have the loon who's utilizing the lake and rivers and wetlands. Um, like Kelly mentioned, the bobcat who is using a wide variety of habitats and moves around quite a bit. And generalists like the moose and the bear who are using a bunch of different habitats over large ranges. And also in 2018, the CLC completed a stream habitat improvement project on Allen Brook, which is a direct tributary to the Shakura Lake. And we partnered with the New Hampshire Fish and Game, Tin Mountain Conservation Center, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, utilizing the EQIP cost share program and the Carroll County Conservation District. And with the stream habitat improvement projects, we, we completed stream surveys of fish, macro invertebrates and insects, placed wood additions in the stream to create pools, riffles and aquatic habitat in the brook and to re-engage the floodplain. And this practice provides a wildlife corridor that allows fish to effectively travel upstream and reproduce and repopulate effectively. And if you've never seen this practice completed, this is kind of what it does. Um, you have a tree that goes across the stream um, and then a pool that re-engages the floodplain behind it and pulls up water. There's leaf litter that connects, collects right in certain spots and is a great habitat for those macro invertebrates. You have a little bit of a riffle, a lot of oxygen coming in here and another pool here. So it kind of completes the entire cycle of how um, rivers and streams used to operate when trees naturally fell into them. So that was a great partner project that we completed. 
Um, currently, the route I'm on, the 19 mile corridor, there are a few crossings, a few bridges right now, mostly for the Shakura River. Um, the aquatic passage is, is really nice under, under these bridges that are here. It's a natural substrate of the river, natural bottom happening here. And this again is the Shakura River. And it's kind of nice because it kind of sneaks in a little bit of um, terrestrial passage and also aquatic passage as well. However, I do think there's future potential for terrestrial wildlife crossing um, on Route 16. Some ideas we thought about is um, maybe possibly an underground road passage structure, such as this one that the moose is going through, or um, a medium-sized mammal passage. This allows aquatic passage, but also the mammals, uh, medium-sized mammals can run across this little bridge here. And, or maybe just a, a small bridge span uh, for terrestrial wildlife passing as well. And we're gonna take a look at what our partners are doing at Green Mountain Conservation Group to in, improve wildlife corridors. They completed a Saco River stream crossing assessment program. In 2020 to 2022, Green Mountain Conservation Group and many partners assessed over 500 crossing sites in Carroll County. And the assessment sites are on this map to the right. In 2023, Green Mountain Conservation Group's goal is to apply for federal funding through FEMA and assist 13 local towns with planning to replace and upgrade 450 crossings. The project will improve aquatic organism passage, flood resiliency, structural integrity, and geomorphic compatibility. And so why are we so concerned? And Haley touched on this a bit as well, but um, we're concerned about stream crossings and structures for aquatic organism passage. Fish and other aquatic species can be migratory and close to half of the fish species of greatest concern need in the wildlife action plan utilize stream and river corridors to reach spawning areas. So you ask, what can I do as a private landowner to support New Hampshire wildlife corridors? Well, again, um, New Hampshire um, land ownership is very interesting. 120,000 landowners privately own over 75% of New Hampshire's forests right now. There are 4.9 million acres of privately owned land in New Hampshire, and there are actually 6 million total acres in the state of New Hampshire. So that means that individually and also on a very large landscape level, we can make a huge impact or difference. And when considering wildlife corridors, climate change is a current and future concern. I just wanted to pop up this um, map and show you that um, in the larger scope of things, the Appalachian Trail Corridor is considered to be a globally significant landscape with climate change. It's considered to be a major migratory route for species to come up on the Eastern Seaboard. So that we're part of that. We're right up here in the Northeast and we're part of that um, corridor. So as a landowner, a private landowner, what you can do um, to, to help wildlife corridors on your property is consciously consider and choose what plants and trees to utilize to promote future survival. American chestnuts are gonna do well. White oak will do well. And this is a least, list of tree species that will be adapted to future climate conditions. Um, basically, they're predicting that balsam fir and spruce and a few, a few of the other um, uh, mountain maple, pin cherry, gray birch, they're gonna be the first to go. Um, what's really gonna survive are some of the oaks, some of the Southern oaks that will be moving up here and red maple and um, a few of the other pitch pines and, and hickories as well. So that's really something to consider for future plantings, what's going to make it. And no matter how much land you own, whether it's one acre, 550 or anything in between, even on a very, very small scale, you could make a difference. Um, if this were your yard in the center of the property, um, and the north side of the property was a corridor that was forested and wildlife passes through. And the south side was also a corridor where wildlife could pass around your yard. And actually the east and west sides are forested by your neighbors as well. Um, that's gonna make a huge difference 
that's going to make a huge difference because 75% of New Hampshire land is privately owned. And um, another thing you can do, as Haley mentioned, to provide um, support for wildlife corridors is explore the New Hampshire Fish and Game Corridors data and discover important corridors in your town to plan and protect them. Um, you can also protect and steward land, consider a conservation easement for the um, conservation of land in perpetuity. These crossings are generally places that historically animals have crossed um, for a long time. So if they're protected, they'll probably keep crossing there. And you can donate time or resources to organizations that do protect land. And in closing, I just wanted to leave you all with, with this thought. Wildlife corridors are often shared human corridors, and the two are intrinsically connected and support survival and well being of all species on the planet, and everything is connected. Thanks thank so you. Much. Thank you, Deborah. Um, we did have one question during your presentation, and Haley, feel free to chime in here as well. Um, Tom asks, similar to defined wildlife management areas, does New Hampshire have defined, formalized, and protected wildlife corridors? The ArcGIS mapping is very helpful to identify the local corridors. I think, um, I know that there are focus areas, and I think Heli may be able to expand on this. There's a Quab and Tagarnican area. There's different areas around the state where um, I think, I believe New Hampshire Fish and Game was focusing on, on certain corridor areas. Yeah, I think uh, to answer the first part of your question, Tom, you know, wildlife management areas are properties that are owned and managed by New Hampshire Fish and Game to benefit wildlife and to provide opportunities for public recreation. Um, they don't have a designation for wildlife corridors because if they were to purchase a property because it's a valuable wildlife corridor, they would probably still manage it as a wildlife management area. That's just basically the, the property designation for um, parcels owned and operated by New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. So, um, but with that said, wildlife corridors, that map I showed you of their prioritization and to Deb's point, all those regional plans are going into those properties that are being uh, purchased and conserved by New Hampshire Fish and Game and smaller regional land trusts as well. Okay. Any other questions? Feel free to ask them in the chat or just raise your hand and unmute yourself. And I'm watching. <laughs> It's late in the day to have questions, you know. <laughs> I'm always I'm just impressed with the ability to listen and absorb information at this time in the day. So true. Um, this a lot is Noreen, of great this, information. This is Noreen Downs. I'm looking at the uh, wildlife map, and could you just re go over the orange and the green? The, the distinction between the orange and the green that you did in the yeah. beginning, Haley? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. The green that you're seeing on the map are what are called prioritized wildlife habitat blocks. And so those are essentially data from another map that New Hampshire Fish and Game has as part of the wildlife action plan. But they're essentially areas, habitat blocks that are bigger than 50, 50 acres in size and that have been identified as a priority in those New Hampshire wildlife action plan maps, either because they've been ranked as the highest habitat, highest ranked habitat in the state of New Hampshire, or the highest ranked habitat in what's called a biological region, um, which is basically just regional areas of New Hampshire. And then the uh, orange color are wildlife corridors. So they are the uh, basically the identified pathways that provide the best connection between those habitat blocks with the least barriers to movement across the landscape for a variety of wildlife species. Does that make sense? Thanks. Thank you. I, I pulled up our town and I just started looking at it. And... <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate yes, it. Absolutely. <laughs> 
All right, I'm going to share my screen. Please feel free to ask any more questions, folks. Just unmute yourself and or ask in the chat feature. Um, I did want to share before everyone left tonight um, a couple of other uh, things, a couple of slides. And um, there's a great book about wildlife crossings that our new program, the GMCG sponsored book program, is trying to add to local libraries for children's sections. Um, this great program is working throughout the Ossipee watershed towns. And if folks are interested in sponsoring this book or any other book on our list, you can visit our website to learn more about those other books. Um, you can contact me if you're um, so inclined to help and sponsor a book in your community. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with folks are some upcoming programs. And some of them relate to what we were talking about tonight with outdoor animal tracking um, in February. And we have uh, Keeping a Nature Journal and Field Sketching in Winter and our Get Wet, that's a groundwater education through water evaluation and training, drinking water testing, basically. Um, and this training is for teachers and volunteers. Um, folks are welcome to learn more at gmcg.org. Um, following this program, I'll share the recording with everyone who registered and we'll also share any resources from our partner organizations at UNH Cooperative Extension and Chikora Lake Conservancy and any resources that tie in with this program, such as the corridors map that Haley shared um, from the New Hampshire Fish and Game website and any other resources that might be of use for you as a landowner or in your local um, community. All right. I think there's one more question, Tara. Okay. I don't see one. Okay. Do you see yeah. it? Yeah, I've got it up on the screen. It says, thank you. Um, Tom says, thank you. It will oh. help me to explain the importance of corridor linkages. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, lots of compliments in the chat feature. Great presentation. Thank you, Haley and Deb. Thanks, great program. Really appreciate you both coming out tonight and um, sharing all your wealth of information. I, I think your programs, your presentations really complemented each other very well. And I learned a lot and I, I'm sure I'm gonna watch the presentation again and um, do some follow-up with that to share what we've learned tonight. All right. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you again. All right, everybody have a great evening. Thank you so much for having me as well. Perfect. Thanks, Deborah.